Disclaimer. We are interested in everything and experts in nothing. We enjoy learning, but get it wrong sometimes. We mean no disrespect, and if we mess up, kindly correct us. Let's take this ride together, unless your intention is to cause harm or distress. In which case, with utmost haste, fuck right off. Here we go, episode 10. 10. We are in double digits. Officially double digits. Officially double digits, and this one is mine. Yep. Yep, I'm going to be talking about patent medicines. Okay, say more. Yeah, patent medicine. What do we think of? Do we think of swarmy smalesmen and bowler hats claiming his magical elixir of duck butt fat cured his male pattern baldness? Or that his vial of East African swamp ass root was the key to saving (laughs) Mrs. Landry's marriage. Swamp ass root? Who would actually believe this stuff? Well, before the passing of the Food and Drug Act, almost everyone. Okay. So a patent medicine is also known as nostrum, from the Latin nostrum remedium, or our remedy. Okay. Is a heavily advertised magical cure all that no doctor would ever prescribe to you, since it would, quote, put them out of business. However, oh, oh God, okay. This is without regard to its actual effectiveness. And today we would consider this to be a pseudoscience. Yeah, okay. So the phrase patent medicine itself comes from the late 17th century. Mm-hmm. When marketing oh. elixirs, if they found favor with royalty, they were issued letters patent authorizing the use of the royal endorsement in the advertising. Okay. This is already not at all where I thought we were going. Okay. I thought this was big pharma who, like, patents their formula so that oh, nobody no. else can use it. Like, no, we're they, already not no, even... Like, we're way, way beyond Yeah, that. this is not we're where I thought back. we were going. All right. This is I'm the... on a ride already. <laughs> okay. Do you remember... Did you watch Pete's Dragon? Maybe? So it's basically the dude rolls into town, he's got his cart, and he's like, ladies and gentlemen, I've got a cure for everything that ails you. If you've yes. got a broken leg, take this. And of course, there's always somebody in the audience who's a plant who takes it and immediately can walk again. What? I just thought about, like, basically evangelicals with their... Oh, we're gonna get there. Okay. Well, All I right. made that connection. Moving on. Keep going, keep going. So the praise patent medicine... The royal family, if they liked it, or a royal person was, would list a letter of patent saying, Hey, I like this. So, if the queen liked your brew, feel free to slap her face on the front of the bottle. Okay. However, few if any of these nostrums were actually patented. Chemical patents did not become into use into the United States until 1925. See, that's where I thought we were going. Yeah, weird. We that's are not before that. Okay. 1925. Okay. <laughs> So also in order to obtain a patent on one of these remedies, manufacturers would have to publicly disclose its ingredients, which most promoters avoided like the plagues they promised they cured. (laughs) Okay. So that wasn't going to happen. So by the middle of the 19th century, uh, the manufacture of similar products had become a major industry in America. So what was common in them? Well, usually they were extremely high in alcohol content. Well... Then you just feel better, but you're not better. Exactly. So the remedies were very popular with those who found this ingredient to be therapeutic. Yeah, okay. So, hey, I drank a quart of this magic elixir and I suddenly feel great for an hour. Yeah, you know, my knee doesn't hurt when I'm blackout drunk drunk to stand on it. On Mr. Popper's swamp ass root from Africa. (laughs) So. Patent medicines were one of the first major product categories that advertising industry promoted. Okay. So, patent medicine promoters pioneered many advertising and sales techniques that were later used for other products. Okay. So, this was kind of like their flagship. So, like, patent medicine gave rise to modern marketing. Pretty much. Okay. They often marketed these products as being medical panseas. Or at least a cure-all for many conditions. Gotcha. They emphasize exotic ingredients and endorsements from purported experts or celebrities. Sound familiar? 
Yeah, I feel like this still happens. It does still happen. And anyone on QVC or anyone was saying, like, this star uses this face cream. Bullshit. They do. They either have good genetics or a damn good plastic surgeon. Yeah. Also, no hate, but you see it all the time all over social media where people in this oh, company yeah. that mm -hmm. it's a for-profit company. It's not. Yeah. I'm not going to name any names. Yeah. There are several, but they have a new product, which is some kind of miracle it's pill. It's a miracle pill or... that will make you lose weight. It's a miracle pill that'll help you sleep. It's a miracle yeah. pill that'll make you want to sleep with your husband again. You know, which really that needs therapy and maybe Definitely. a reevaluation of life choices. But Definitely. not going to be found in a pill. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So this still happens. Oh, it still happens. But okay. back then... It just happened all the time. There was no regulation on it. It was, oh, well, they said it's true. It must be true. See, all they have to do now is say the FDA doesn't endorse it. And you're done. Yeah. But this okay. was before the FDA. Gotcha. Yep. So basically, it all can't be swollen pockets and swollen corpses lined on the side of the road. Because <laughs> sales were increasingly being constricted in the United States in the early 20th century as the Food and Drug Administration and the Federal Trade Commission came into be, and they kept increasing regulations to prevent fraud, unintentional poisoning, yeah, and the deceptive advertising. So, okay. for example, sellers of liniments, which was a medicated topical lotion or a cream to be applied to the skin, okay, claimed to contain snake oil and falsely promoted it as a cure-all. Hence, the term snake oil salesman... That's what I was going to say! ...becoming a lasting symbol for a charlatan. Okay. So that's where we get that whole snake oil salesman, it's snake oil, whatever. I what don't. would snake oil even be? Oh, I'm sure it was like Is that a real oil. thing? No, it's not. It's not. See, that's the thing. They didn't tell you what the actual ingredients were, so they could say whatever they wanted was in it. Oh, this is snake oil. This is some rare East African root. Most of the time, it was alcohol and mineral oil. Okay. It had nothing to do with what it said on the front. Okay. Um, so, here we go. Many promoters desire to lend their preparations a sense of exoticism and mystery. Unlikely ingredients such as the African boabab tree fruit and oxyan tablets. They were a popular cure-all of the time. What was an oxyan tablet? It didn't tell me what was in it, but they basically looked like those teething tablets we gave our kids before teething tablets were found to be... Not great for your kids. I totally forgot about those. <laughs> well, our kids are old. Yeah. Because we're old. Oh. But anyway, <laughs> but as an example of famous patent medicine of the period was Dr. Kimmel's swamp root, which of course had unspecified roots found in swamps, which would give you remarkable effects on your kidneys. So said the advertising. Yeah. What did it really do? It didn't tell me. It wasn't like it was turpentine or anything. Like these okay. are just what it promised to cure. Okay. Um, we will get into what some of them actually did okay, so on certain ones. But uh, the problem is they didn't tell you what was in them. And so also they didn't have any way of tracking what was happening based on whatever specific patent medicine they were taking. So did this person die of a heart attack or did this person die from taking a magic cure-all pill that was really asbestos or something? Ooh. You know, we just don't know. Yeah. We will get into it more where it's an obvious how these people died. Okay. But these so far, there's not a lot of information on what was actually in them and what they actually did, just what it was advertised to be. Okay. So just the because advertising still exists. Just because it said it did that doesn't necessarily mean that it did something hugely negative. No. It may have done most, mostly nothing. Most of these were including, the most of the things this had was alcohol, basically. Okay, yeah. Okay. So when it told you... Okay, this will ease your pain, it will calm you down, blah, blah, blah. Well, alcohol would potentially do that for a time. Yeah. So it was easy just to claim what it was in there. What? Oh. Memory. Yeah, a really vague one. Okay. What the heck was it that Abraham Lincoln was taking that ended up to be mercury? Well, he might have actually been taking mercury um, because that is something that was used. I thought it had a different name. Colloidal silver? Maybe that might be it. That's something that is still used today. There are some things that they used mercury specifically to treat. Um, like, I don't think he had syphilis, did he? No, this was actually for depression. It was, oh. it was something blue, I think. I'm going to look it up. Hang okay. on. You, I know. I, Brief aside, I don't mean to take it over. No, but... I Googled. You Google. <laughs> we all Google in the end. So while you're looking that up, 
Yes. I'm going to tell you the story behind Dr. Morse's Indian root pills, which was the mainstay of the Comstock patent medicine business. Comstock was one of the big manufacturers. Per the information written on the wrapper of each and every pill box, Dr. Morse was a trained medical doctor who enriched his education by traveling extensively throughout Asia, Africa, and Europe. Also, he supposedly lived with the Native Americans for three years, during which time he discovered the healing properties of various plants and roots, which led him to eventually combining them into Dr. Morse's Indian root pills. Here's the thing, though. No one knows if Dr. Morse actually ever existed. Oh, so he was like a fictitious, fictitious mascot, basically? Basically, yeah. They basically went, ah, oh, let's throw this together and put some fancy dude on it, and we'll say that he's some fancy specialist from all over. Yeah, nobody knows if he actually existed. Uh, towards the end of the period, a number of radioactive medicines, so here we go, knowing this okay. shit actually Here's where did it gets dark. the worst thing ever, containing ur- uranium or radium, okay. were marketed. Some of these actually contained the promised ingredients. Some of them didn't. So, yay for those who lied about the radium. (laughs) But the ones who were spot on... uh (laughs) Uh-oh. Yeah. And they were a number of tragedies among their devotees. Most notoriously, there was a steel industrialist heir. His name was Ebenezer McBurney Byers. That doesn't sound real. It is. He went by Eben because Ebenezer... Eben. Eben, okay. Ebenezer, but, you know, he kind of got screwed on the name, but he didn't have a choice there. Yeah. But he was a supporter of the popular radium water, Radithor, which was developed by a medical con artist named William J.A. Bailey. And, of course, Byers contracted fatal radium poisoning and had to have his jaw removed. Oh, my God. In an attempt, which was unfortunately unsuccessful, to save him from bone cancer. Oh, God. Due to him drinking nearly 1,400 bottles of Bailey's radium water. Holy crap. Yeah. Okay, but that's me if White Monster ends up being carcinogenic, because <laughs> I'm out of here. I drink way too many. So that's me if Monster is like that. So if Monster contains radium, we can expect you to lose your jaw. Only the white ones. Oh, okay, only the white ones. The white ones, yeah. Okay. Maybe that doesn't contain radium. Everybody else is going to lose their jaw, but you will keep it. I'm just saying, it sounds like a lot of those, but then when I consider how I drink Monster... It sounds like a lot, and it is a lot, when you think of how much radium he was chucking back on the regular. That way, yes. Is That's why it's a scary number. You said, what, 1,400 bottles? 1,400 bottles of Bailey's radium water. Oh... How many so, bottles of Monster would you consume? Um, all right. So I routinely drink two Monsters a day, sometimes three. Um, at three a day, that's 467 days, which is just over, what, a year and yeah. three months? Yep. 15 months? Yep. Yeah, I've been drinking it like this for six, seven years. <laughs> I'm so fucking Okay, we're not sponsored if... by Monster, oh, and we, we are, not. are not saying that their no stuff allegations. contains radium. We're <laughs> no just sponsoring. saying... No allegations. I'm just putting it in perspective <laughs> in, for my in own modern mind. modern day perspective... Oh, heck. She'd be fucked. I'd be um, fucked. It's fine. No jaw. It would not be attractive. That would be me. Yep. It would be hard for you to continue with the podcast with no lower jaw. It really would be. I mean, it'd be hard for you to live with no lower jaw. That's probably the more relevant fact. <laughs> but this would certainly be the end of the podcast, and Damn it would it. be due to radium monsters. Oh, God. Okay. Uh, another nasty product that was touted at the time was the water irradiator. Oh, God. It was sold as a product that promised to infuse water placed inside it with radon. And did it? Uh huh. Oh, God. Wait. It was considered to be healthy at the time. That's why they they were putting radium in everything. Beauty products, toothpaste. Don't they test basements for radon? Because, okay. Yeah. All right. I'm just making sure I've got the same thing. We're well beyond that now. (laughs) But back then, they're like, oh, look, you're glowing. That means you're healthy and not at all going to die. Shit. Because once we, I mean, eventually we will do the radium girls. Yes, that's and on the list. That's on the list. And one thing that was about them is they'd be like, oh, let's get all the paint flex, extra paint flex on us. Because when we go to the dance halls, we'll glow. Yeah, that ended very badly for all of them. 
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but we'll get into that in a different A different episode. episode. That's not this. But this was back when radium was the newest, awesomest thing. And what time is this? Um, this is in, still in the early 1900s.